So at the beginning, we had a different name, but after that, I, I named it um, Mini Players because I consider that any kid that is coming to the court, I have to consider it as a little player uh, joining the sport. And the mission is, okay, we have to engage these kids. Uh, I have to try to get this kid playing today for the first time. And I want to see this kid playing in 10 years time, not just dropping off the sport because it's not, it's not funny. It's not, it's not for me. No, no, I don't want that. I want the kids to play all the time. So um, if we, if you want, if you want to see something, I can share the screen and uh, I would like to share some videos. I made an eight minute, eight minute clip with uh, different things that I work with little kids. And uh, every minute and a half, two minutes, we'll stop it and we can discuss it if you, if you think it's okay. Uh, as Davor said, if you want to ask any questions, right, Davor? Yeah, sounds good. So any questions, write them, write them in, the, in the chat box, please. And uh, we have it open already so you guys can hear us. I was asking that earlier. So yeah, so Martin is going to show us uh, the video. All right, let's start by sharing this. There's no sound, okay? So I took the music off because I, I'm too rocker for this. But I <laughs> didn't want to disturb anyone. <laughs> but uh, you'll see different things that I do with little kids, um, working not specifically with uh, technique, the beginning. You see those are three, four, five-year-olds, six-year-olds. This is in Mexico last year. Um, this is the first time these two kids were playing. That was the first time. Um, and we tried to do something like a cooperative work and uh, no technique, just understanding that they have to work with, with each other and trying to develop some skills like this kids, for example, using their hands, not the rackets. Uh, you see that it's difficult for them to use, for example, the left hand, their righties. Uh, but even if it's difficult, it's good, uh, good to push a little bit, push them a little bit um, to see, you know, this kid is playing with two hands. I'm not saying that I don't care about technique. This is something I, okay, I'm going to stop now. Um, this is something I, I have to deal with um, in, in discussions sometimes because some people consider that I'm not technical when I'm not teaching forehands and backhands to kids at this ages early ages. And that's not true. I'm extremely technical. The thing is that I learned after all these years that if you put a racket, racket on a kid, let's say a four-year-old kid, and uh, you focus too much on teaching the, the forehand technique, which is the first shot that we always teach, um, we're, I think we're missing something. Number one, uh, it's going to be too technical, so the kid is not going to move. It's going to get a lot of instructions. I don't think he's, the kid is going to understand all those instructions. But the main thing that we're missing is that a kid is coming to play a sport. And a sport is based on games, based on moving, running, chasing a ball, or in this case. And when we have a kid standing still, swinging a racket only when the, the coach drops the ball, I don't think that's funny. I think it's too technical, too mechanical, and then there's no, kids don't develop any abilities that, that way. They're only just reproducing a technical gesture that we are programming for them. But uh, what's the funny part in that? So I understand a lot of friends tell me, yeah, but we have to teach the technique in order for them to play better after that, when they learn it. And I understand that, obviously. We have to teach technique, but there are ways of teaching. When we play football or soccer or basketball, we don't spend two years passing the ball against the wall, you know, with the proper technique or just kicking the ball with the inside of the foot just to make sure the ball goes straight. We don't do that. We run, we chase the ball, we kick, we kick it. You see a, a football game of five-year-olds and all, they're, they're all chasing the ball like crazy, like maniacs. And that's fun for them. And then the, the job of the coach 
is to organize that and give it form and teach technique prog progressively. You don't have to teach technique the first day and say, listen, if you don't have, if you don't know how to kick that ball, if you don't know how to pass that ball, if you don't know how to throw it, you cannot play baseball, basketball, or football. Okay, we have to make it fun. And this is something that I learned from the experience of being a 52 year old coach. Kids nowadays are not as skillful as we were um, 34 years ago. It's not that they are, we have to blame them. It's, we, don't have, we should blame the parents or us, right? But um, the thing is, we have to understand that if kids are doing, you know, they, they play more with iPads now than we, when than playing with, with a ball. So there's, their level of skills are very low and they're starting playing tennis, for example, in our sport, at three, four, five year olds. When now, when 20, 30 years ago, I, I started playing when I was 11. So things are different. We cannot teach the same way as 30, 40, 40 years ago. We have to adapt. Society changed, um, cell phones, uh, social media, the, 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 the technology changed everything in our lives. We have to adapt, okay? So um, I'm gonna stop because I, I'm in Argentina and I talk too much. Okay, <laughs> Davor, you can stop me now. No, yeah, no, like I think that's interesting points. And um, guys, as, as I said, if you have any questions, put them in the box. Um, so one is, you know, when, when the kids go, as you mentioned, soccer, right? So they don't have to hit, like it's so hard, obviously, right, to hit the ball over the net with the racket. It's very skillful. And I think the challenge is for us as coaches in tennis, it's not like in soccer, you have 20 kits, you throw a ball out and you can do things, right? As you said, they run around and hit. I think that our sport is so, so much harder because um, they can't just, we can't give them a ball and they play tennis, right? Over, over, over the net, right? I'm just not, not saying there are different ways to do it. So, so that's the challenging part, like to, to create something on court with a lot of kids where they feel like I'm doing something that's fun and it's playful, right? So what do you think about stations on courts, Martin? Like stationary training? I, I love them. I love them. Number one, because you keep a lot of kids busy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I do not make lines. I hate lines. You know, when the kids are waiting uh, for two, three, four, five minutes to hit three balls and then have to pick up all those balls and then get back to the line. Um, tracks or um, stations, what, what they do is that they give you the chance to work with kids, uh, with different, uh, a big number of kids probably, um, but they are doing something useful. If you know what to do in terms of setting up good stations, you can work on footwork here. You can do um, ball tracking in, on, in another station and, and one station they can throw and catch. And um, in another station, they can be working with you on, on footwork or just hitting. Um, so that's the best part of that. You, you can have lots of kids and all active and all doing something specific. Yeah, like David. Um, this is what I do. This is what I do all the time. David Edwards said, "Like love stations, lots of interest and high attention levels." Yeah, I agree. Like it's uh That's my friend, David. Yeah, I I used to. Uh, I used to, uh, you know, I lo I love stations as well. And if you plan them right, you and you show the kids. I think a, a very underrated part is when we teach the kids the didactics and pedagogics it is so important that you right off the bat at the beginning when you teach kids that you have a structure and then they will do it you know i i found like when i fly around the world or i used to a lot of programs like i, I, I feel like that was missing when the kids come to me i always have to to re-implement things and i ask myself so many times why do i have to do that why isn't it from the beginning do you agree with that if we do something from the right off the bat from the beginning they know it's not different right so that should be done yeah i think we're missing something that is extremely important and we were not thinking about that and that is um 
we tell the kids what to do. You stand here, you put the hand, left hand here if you're right, righty, uh, left hand here, rack it back, just swing, finish the shot, do it again, pick up the ball, do it again. Um, okay, where's the decision making there? Are we teaching the kids to think? Are we teaching the kids to make a decision about something? No, they're just reproducing a shot, a gesture, and then just following instructions. That's it. So the problem is that, and I've said this during this confinement time, um, we've discussed a lot with other coaches, that tennis is such a difficult, a, a specific sport because we train um, collectively. We train in groups, but we play individually. We play, we play mostly singles. We as coaches, we give the kids a lot of instructions all the time. It's like a, a speech at the UN. Boom, boom, information, information, information. Do this, do that, bend your knees, follow through, hit there, hit here. Uh, but when they play matches, we cannot talk to them. So we don't, we're not teaching the kids how to make decisions on their own. We don't, we don't do that. That's a huge mistake. So, and then we as coaches, we complain, yeah, but we cannot co co you know, do coaching to players. We understand, we have to understand that. That's the rule number one in tennis when we started playing. Coach, the coach cannot talk to a player. So stop complaining about that. I can understand the, the argument that if, uh, like any other sport, coaches are screaming and telling instructions all the time. That's fantastic. Okay, I understand that. But in tennis, it's like in rugby. If a coach starts complaining because, yeah, but my, my players cannot throw the ball forward. Obviously, that's the number one ruling in, in rugby. You know, you pass the ball backwards. You know, that, that's, that's it. Stop complaining about coaching. Teach your kids not to make, uh, not to follow instructions, to make decisions. I like that. I, that's why I love Phil Jackson. Yeah. Like That's why I love Phil Jackson. I, I used to watch a lot of NBA back in the days, and um, I, I was to watch him. You know, all the coaches screaming and you know running up and down the court, and then he was sitting, legs crossed, and just not even talking to the players. And he said, "You know, I, I don't need to t talk to them. They know what to do because we work on that. They know how to make decisions, and they decide in the game. They make the decisions, not me." That's fantastic. That's what we should do. Teach the kids to make decisions. If they make mistakes, we we'll work on that during the week. I love that. I love it. it. All right, uh, Martin, we have a question for Martin yep. Pioli. The next one, yes. Uh, station, how, how, many, how many students and how many helpers? Okay, that's a good question because obviously you're not going to have 20 kids on a court because it looks like crazy and uh, it looks like you're trying to make a lot of money and not teaching anything. But I do have a lot of kids based on my experience. And I know I, I, I set up like three different tracks facing the net. So I have all the kids moving all the time and doing different activities. Um, I keep them active, but I know how to handle that. If, for example, I have other coaches doing the same thing, probably with two coaches and eight kids, probably 10 kids, that's fine. We can do it. Two and coaches, all the kids are moving because once you learn once you teach sorry the the mechanics the dynamic of the session the kids they know it by themselves they make decisions by themselves and they know how to do it they know what to do and they move all the time and every time you know i try to work on different um obstacle, obstacle tracks to work different abilities like jumping with two feet or doing zigzag or just, you know, trying to go under a tunnel with, with um, sticks so um, they have to bend their knees. Um, the thing is, after the, they finish the track, they hit the ball or they push the ball towards the net. And, and one thing I do, this is, uh, I know it's very peculiar. I don't use baskets. I don't feed balls or I don't even use a racket during the session. Because my idea is that every shot, every, everything they do with the ball, that ball has to have a meaning and a destination. So every time they hit, every time they even throw the ball, they push it with the racket, 
they have to get that ball back and go back to the tracks and start again, start the sequence again. So what happens with that? At every, every ball counts. When you feed 20 balls and the kids are hitting 20 balls, and they hit probably 10 balls into the net, three balls out, three balls with the frame, the quality of those shots, most of them, they're bad. And the kids are not even focused on and hitting every shot correctly. When, they ha- when you tell the kid, listen, you go to the tracks, when you finish, you have to hit the ball to me. Drop the ball. This is something I do. I let the kid drop the ball and hit it. Hit the ball to me. If you miss, you have to pick up. Go get it. If you hit it too hard and you miss me, you have to go get it. And kids don't like that. So what they do is you know, they drop the ball and hit it soft. But by hitting the ball soft and under control, you prepare them to rally by themselves immediately because they control the, the ball in short space and they know where to hit the ball with direction and not too much power. So this is what I do. And uh, it really works for me. It really works. I would recommend that to try it at least. But having, as, as Martin was asking, 10, 10 kids, probably with one assistant, you can, you can manage that perfectly. I th- yeah, I, I think... That's a good number. I agree with that 100% too. Martin, let's show us the next minute and a half of the video and then we get back to the yep. questions. We have a couple more there, but let's do. Let's go. Uh, this is a kid. The story of this video, this kid was waiting for his brother all the time. So his brother playing in the background. So um, I said to a mother, listen, can I invite him to play? And he joined and he was running with me for 20 minutes that way. And he loved it. Obviously, next week, the following week, he joined the, the program. And he is a good player. Now you see that I'm trying to use anything that I can possibly cut, you know, get the attention of the kids. Trying to do the strike zone here, like baseball. Special awareness, something I learned from uh, other coaches. Um, trying to move the kids away from the cones and not crashing into each other. Lots of split steps. I love teaching the kids split steps. And wait, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here because I want to say something about this. Uh, Well, first of all, as, as you saw, the little ones, they do more than uh, just hitting forehands and backhands. They do a lot of ball tracking and catching balls with their hands. And they, I try to make the, the, the sessions very interactive. They they very cooperative. They work as teams. Something I teach from the very beginning. We are a team. We are a team. It's not you're the most skillful, you're going to win every time. And you're not the most skillful, you're, so you're going to pick up all the balls. I don't do that. We are a team. We do everything together, and we all you know, cooperate and uh, and help each other. But so that's the part with the little ones. But when they start playing, this is something I don't see. I'm, I've never seen actually. Um, but I want I don't want to sound arrogant. Like I, no one's doing this but but me. But uh, I teach progressions on how to return the serve. How to prepare for that? You see, as you can see in this video, they do a split step and they catch the ball. Very simple, but they un- they understand. They start understanding the technique. Split step and just try to make contact in front. And I think this is something we have to teach because um, the returns of serves, slides backhands, one-handed backhand volleys. Second serves are the most um, forgotten shots in tennis. If you allow me that that word. Um, I don't think we teach them properly, especially at young ages. And uh, this is something we can prepare for them. I mean, we can prepare them for the future by teaching this stuff. I'll continue. This is another thing. When they six, seven year old work on the continental grip, and progressions, make it fun. And then they start you know, doing the serves. With lo- lots of progressions. The, this is something, I'm gonna stop here and uh, I'll stop sharing the screen. Serves, 
um, are very peculiar because you know, I've seen a lot of times that we teach it with the forehand grip in order to make the kids getting the ball in make, and make it easier for them. Okay? But I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that because after that, they go, they're going to get used to that forehand grip and that's going to be tough for us to change that and difficult for the kids to understand that they have to change it. Why don't we work on the continental grip and the pronation with different progressions? We make it fun. We make it as a game. How many times you can hit the ball with the frame? If you make one or two, that's fine. You don't have to make 20. I'm not going to make it extremely difficult for you. But make one. Probably next week, if you do three, you're going to be a great champion. If you do five at the end of the month, that's fantastic. And if they're six years old, okay, what's the rush? We can teach them progressively how to use the continental grip. And by the time they're seven, they do the pronation very naturally. And by the time they're eight, they're swinging the racket, and they're swinging a serve with a perfect pronation with no effort. We can take our time to do this. We have to prepare from the very beginning to do this. But we take our time. We don't teach serves in two weeks and try to get the ball in, in with any uh, any kind of grip in order to get results. If we do it progressively and we, we have a, a long-term plan, we start early with progressions. By the time they're eight, which is extremely young kid, by the time they're eight, they're, they, they can perfectly serve with a good technique. Ever? Yeah. And then, um, you know, talking about the serve, uh, what I like to do is like, you know, the, the, the half motion when, the, when they start from up here, you can make it, as you said, you can progress, right? So you can let them start from up here. And there are so many ways um, how you can engage the kids um, to, to use a continental grip from the beginning. You know, I've, I've shot a lot of videos. Um, so I personally work, you know, with getting the right grip as the continental grip, talking about that. You know, I like from, not to make advertising, but on court, off court has those grip pins, right? I show that mm -hmm. a lot of my videos where you can put it on yeah. the racket and you can slide them in, you put it on for them and they have the right grip. They're, they're different tools. Yeah, there are rackets that are already made with the continental grip. Then you can, what I love to do when you put the racket under the armpit and the grip is sticking out and you get the racket out, like from the, you go grip around and you pull it out. You have basically almost the perfect continental. So I think it's important for coaches that the coaches have like their, their, their ways, their good ways to show them an easy way. For me, the best way that works is this, where they put the racket under the armpit and the kid comes from the side and gets the racket out. They have almost a perfect continental. So I love doing this because that's so easy for them and they all remember that. And as you said, why? The same problem is like with beginner players, right? Why do we have to teach them a foreign grip to hit over? There's no reason if they're that if you teach someone something with the right progressions from the beginning, it doesn't matter how old they are, they're going to learn it. So I'm, I'm, I'm right on board with that. And I, I, I agree a hundred percent with that. And yeah. Um, yeah, hundred percent. So let's go yeah. back to answer like a couple of questions again. Yeah, Jeff, I see a question from Jeff. Yeah. That's, that's the next one. Exactly. How can parent coach help developmental toughness and competitive spirit while keeping tennis fun and enjoyable? So how do we maintain? Um, I, it, that's, that's tough for parents to try to coach their kids. It's difficult because you can't, sometimes you can't separate knowing that your kid is a little bit lazy at home and never makes, never making bed or, never, you know, um, helping with the dishes and you want to get on, want to get them on the court and then you want them to be rough on a doubt. And, uh, that's not going to happen probably. But, uh, for example, I have two kids. They play tennis. Um, my kids are 18 and 17 now. Um, I started teaching them when they were five and four. Only one hour on Sundays um, between my, my private lessons. And uh, my idea was I want the kids to play the sport. I don't want them to compete. If they compete, that's fine. But my idea is I want to be... I want them to be 15. I want them to be 25 and go on Sunday Sunday afternoon and hit with me. And I, for example, my when my my kids started playing 
in their club in our in our club and they started playing by teams or you know in single competitions um i never pay attention to their matches i always wanted to see are you okay you're having fun no you, you lost the match um, do you know why okay um okay what do you want to eat <laughs> that's it no more discussions um do you want to go home now or do you want to stay at the club that was it. That was my second question after what was the result. Okay. Um, I was never concerned about that. And I think I've never been pushy about, okay, if, you know, I'm a coach, we have a club, we have a basket, we have rackets. Let's play. Let's play more hours. No, no, no. You want to play? Go with your friends. You have a tournament. Okay. I'll take it to a tournament. Um, but I, I'm going to have, have a coffee and talk to the coaches. Cause I, I know the coach is there. Um, I'm not really watching your match. You tell me after what happened, or I want to walk around and ask you to score, and then I'll go to um, say hi to another friend. I've never been pushy about that, and I that is something I um, I think I did good in that department. But um, going crazy about teaching the kids a lot, and then um, sometimes we f we forget that they they need to have fun. They need to have fun. If they have fun probably they are going to ask you to play more. They're going to ask you for, a, for a, a, a tougher training session. If they don't enjoy it, mm -mm. even if you're a your great coach and you're pushing a lot and you think you're doing good for them, if they don't enjoy it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So you, you make sure that they enjoy it. It's a good advice. That's number one. And you can see in their faces. Yeah. That's a great advice. Um, Martin, let's go on mm -hmm. the bottom. I like that from Eric Rothschild. How do you help young beginners to avoid opening strings on contact and hitting the ball too mm -hmm. high? Maybe you can start with that one and I'm going to give my two cents to that one as well. You want to say something about it? Yeah, I mean, so what I do, what I like to do is uh, I like to integrate the kids always with what I'm doing. So I, what, 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 what worked really well is I let the kids draw a smiley face on their strings, right? So that two eyes and a smiley face. And whenever they contact, the smiley face points to me as a coach, I tell them. So that visual clicked with so many kids. I tried so many things, but the, the best thing was I drew the smiley face on the racket face, let them do it. They all had different colors, so they all loved it. That was one session I did with the group. And then when they contact, you can see that face. If the face if I can't see it, the strings point up at contact, you know, they didn't do it right. So that was one clue that, that really clicked with, with the kids that, that I started doing. So, yeah, I like doing that. Yeah, I like working with the kids at very close range. You'll see a lot of videos that we show after that. Um, I, I always work in close range because I understand that the, that's the best way for the kids to understand how to control the ball. If you just let them hit, uh, and I've seen lots of videos on Instagram or Facebook about kids hitting the ball, and wow, that kid hits the ball really hard. I want to see where the ball is landing. If a six-year-old hitting the ball too hard, hey, the ball is hitting the fence. That's fantastic. The kids have a lot of, you know, power. But uh, if you play a mini tennis match, it's going to lose because she's not going to have any idea how to get the ball in because it's always hitting the ball too hard and, to, and way out. So if you cl work close range, the kids control the ball a lot. But uh, what happens if they're close, obviously the strings are open, but once they get better and I start moving away from them, I, a lot of times I work in the same, on the same side of the court. When I go to the other side of the net, obviously they have to hit over the net, that ball going up. Um, it's, it, it's a benefit for them. But uh, once I start moving away from them, they understand that I have to hit the ball with more depth. And uh, the, the strings are going, you know, they adapt to the needs that they have. Uh, they have to hit the ball forward instead of hitting the ball up. So um, that's the way that I, I work with them. If I see something uh, that is not working, I'm very peculiar about this. I, I'm, I don't allow them to repeat a mechanic that is not going to be useful in the future.
I like Martin. I like the you know like since that's why we started the tennis house master class series with brilliant coaches like you. I, I love that. So you know what I forget sometimes what you said is keeping close range. You know, it's as close as you keep the kids as, as more challenging as it will be for them to control it. But, you know, I have a five-year-old, so I was laughing when you said the kid hits the ball to the fence. That's totally my son. So I always have to remind myself as well, keeping the distance uh, shorter and then forcing them basically to control it. I, I like that. And then, um, Martin, Mats Lindgren asks, do you teach continental grip also for rallies on small courts? So you go first on that one. Yeah, let me show you. I'll show you this. I was, you know, we were doing the continental grip here on the serve. But watch this. This is a reaction, decision making, and trying to, you know, solve some continental grip. The yellow ball is a backhand, blue ball is a forehand. You see a lot of videos from this kid because I was working um, in private lessons with him. He's here again. Progressions on the volleys. When I work with the uh, shots like, for example, volleys that we use continental grips, I do a lot of progressions on how to grab the racket. You see? He's grabbing the racket from the throat, only making contact, only concerned about that, not even moving his body. Now sliding progressively the, the hand towards the top of the grip or the bottom of the grip. And then actually then you're seeing the split step and the forehand. And then you see here, this is in Greece. Kids doing soft touches. I love this. This one is good. I end, I end up losing this point. You see his reaction after. But working the soft touch, it's fun. It's very good for the reflexes, um, the reaction, decision making. He gave me a fist bump. I hate that. I hate that. I'm yeah. I, there's nothing I could do there. He beat me. I have to admit it. Um, but I, I do a lot of. Uh, I do use a lot of continental grip um, progressions and games like that. I I try to make it fun for the kids, but. Um, with the uh, content grip, we do volleys, we do slice back in, uh, we do serves. Eventually, the between the lecture, <laughs> um, but uh, we need to use it. We need to learn how to use that. We need to teach. I'm sorry, how to use that and um, doing these progressions with little kids. We have to make it fun for them but uh, make him understand that it's, it's important for them to, to use it properly. And it's gonna be easier for them to do something like volleys or slice backing. I'll continue with this. This is a girl that came to Barcelona from England. She wanted to work with me for a week. She was hitting pretty nice, uh, clean, clean shots, but her footwork was bad. So I was doing a lot of football games with her, touching uh, touches. <clears throat> A close range too. You see, I'm always in the same side of the court. And I'm not going to stop this because I want to say something about it. Um, by working close range, you also, you don't need to use that many balls. So that's good for your budget if you don't have to buy that many balls. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is something I, I, this happens a lot in Spain that, you know, there's a, there are a lot of people working with kids using all yellow balls because they, according to them, they say they don't bounce that much. And when I ask them, why don't you buy, you know, red balls or orange balls? I don't have a budget for it. So I use all balls. So if you teach this way, you probably buy five balls, five orange, five red, that's it. For a group of five kids, you're gonna use them and it's not gonna affect your money, your, your pocket. See, same progression here. This kid is doing back in, back in volleys, progressions on the grip, and then adding some movement, and then now playing. Very competitive kid, very nice. And uh, we have to teach him progressively these things. This is my, the key. Also, one thing I'm very focused on, balance, balance. That's important. I'm going to stop sharing this screen now. 
so you can see our ugly faces. Um, <clears throat> balance is more, the most important thing for me. We can teach good technique. We can have, if we take our time to teach good technique, we can have Roger perfectly. It's, it's easy to teach a, a mechanic, okay? But the problem is when the ball comes to the corner and the kids don't know how to move, that Roger's technique disappears and they turn into my grandmother, right? So um, it's important for me to teach them how to move and control their balance when they move, when they stop, when they hit, and when they recover. So that's why if you play close range, you don't play at high speed. And kids can understand how to use their bodies, how to control their bodies, how to control the shots. They can understand the, the entire um, dynamic of the shot, hitting, I mean, running, chasing the ball, stopping, hitting, recovering. And uh, we, can, we can teach them how to use their body in the proper way. Obviously, you see Novak hitting, sliding, swinging the rocket up here with the ankle facing forward. You know, the only hit can do that, but we, we cannot teach that thing. We cannot teach that. We have to, you know, teach the proper way, the proper technique, avoid the possibility of any injuries, um, and work on the, the best position that I can possibly have on every shot, even if they're standing in the, in the middle of the court or if they have to move to the corner or they have to chase a short ball. That's my opinion. Uh, it's important to, to have the kids knowing what to do in every moment. All right, Martin, let me see a um, couple more. Oh, Rajiv, that, uh, with COVID-19, are you changing how you work with groups? I'm only doing semi-privates at this point. So with having COVID, you know, like with distancing and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, like we, we have to make sure to teach within the guidelines right and not let the kids get too close so it's a little bit more challenging obviously yeah, yeah. um well the, for the past three weeks we have been working in barcelona for because clubs are, are closed but uh, only high performance can play but we're reopening next monday um we have to follow some procedures like no more than six kids or six people and, and any groups I have a session on Wednesday with 30 kids on one court, court and a half, because there are two mini tennis courts on the side. Um, but uh, we're going to have to change that because especially it's an indoor court, so we have to spread the kids out. We're going to do a lot of uh, stations, different stations in different corners and on the corners of the, the court, and uh, we're going to work on that. Um, because we have to, yeah. but uh, it, it's a good way to have the kids moving, doing different things, working different abilities and um, working a lot of coordination, how to handle the racket or um, ball tracking games. And it's, it's, it's fun for that part. If you have to do it with other kids, it's more difficult because they want to play and it's difficult for them to be doing something very specific in, in a small area. But uh, with little kids, it's not a problem. Uh, Martin Bo Summerhill, he's like, would you ever teach a single hand, forehand on each side and disregard a two-handed backhand or single hand backhand and have two forehands? I'm toying with this idea to do with my child. Okay, um, when I started working with little kids, I, I let them do. I, I, my motto is that they have to discover things. I don't have to teach them all the time what to do. So I let them do things. And if they throw a ball with the hand, with the right hand and then the left hand, then they do it you know, pretty much the same. And if they want to hit a forehand or they push the ball with the racket and they push it with the forehand, with the right hand, and they're doing it with the same, same thing with the left hand, I let them do it. Yeah. Because eventually, if that kid is going to be either righty or lefty, and it's going to hit a two-handed backhand, that most of the kids are hitting two-handed backhands, um, by knowing what to do properly with two hands, that's going to be fantastic. That's what Rafa has. 
That's what happens with Rafa. He can hit with both hands. So what happens? His backhand is it's a power force. His the, the backhand is a rocket because he can. It's like a. It's almost hitting a forehand. And his forehand, not, not this one, the one where he hits the ball forward, where he swings the racket forward. I've been very close to Rafa many times, and uh, when you see that forehand. When you hear the sound of those strings, they say, oh, come, come, come on, you're going to pop the strings anytime soon. <laughs> so um, you just let him do it. If eventually, when you, uh, I don't know how old, old is your kid, but uh, eventually they're going to choose the side or you see which side is more uh, efficient. But let him do it. Hi. Yeah, I'll just jump in there quickly. I do the same thing with the kids. And I try to teach them to do both sides when they're four, five, six, seven. I, I, I encourage them. I always tell them when you throw with the right hand, throw now with the left hand. When you do those with the right leg, kick the ball, kick it with the left leg because it's going to only help them, help them. So I think that's important. Mats Lindgren has said, how much do you practice coordination versus tennis strokes and rallies point play? How much do you practice coordination versus tennis strokes? Uh, I do a lot of coordination, but most of the times um, what I want them to do is rally between themselves. I, I'm not against baskets because at one point you need to work on technique and repetitions, but I want the kids to play. I want them to be playing tennis, live tennis, real tennis. Not just, you know, getting a feed from a coach, uh, a perfect ball to the forehand. Where they don't have to move. The ball always weighs high. I don't want that. I want them to learn how to control the ball. Uh, you gave them specific instructions. You hit the ball cross court. You hit the ball down the line. You hit, try to hit the cone here. Uh, if the ball is moving, if you have two cones and the ball is outside the cones, try to hit the ball high and cross court and recover your position. Um, I try to, you know, have them playing a lot, but always the ball under control. That's the most important thing for me. Martin, when you have the little kids that are five, six, like do you, do you, when they play, do you use like progressions, like for example, having two rackets and, you know, they hit, the, they catch the ball between the strings, right? And throw them back over. So do you use those things or like? I use that a lot. Okay. You have no idea. They, I have, <clears throat> I have tons of videos from the club, but I'm not allowed to show them. Mm -hmm. I don't have the, um, that possibility. Otherwise I'll be posting those videos. And let me tell you, they're, they're fantastic, but I, because I do a lot of things with them, very creative. I, I, I'm very creative for, for that. But uh, I do a lot of things about um, balance, how to, I ask them how to carry balls without using their hands or use, using cones or, and, and, and you see, you have to see how they react, they, how creative they are. The kids are very creative. We don't use that. We don't, we don't um, take advantage of that. We teach them so many things that we, we don't use in their creativity. And that, that's, that's a good thing for them. Uh, there's questions. When I rally with my two students, 11 and 13, they're all over the place with form and, and footwork. Yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> when they are having fun, I don't want them to forget that about the two things. And I establish. Yeah. Um, if the kids, it, it, depending on the level of the kids, obviously, if you have recreational kids, you're not going to go too crazy about um, technique. Let them have fun. But obviously, if they're doing something like they're holding the racket this way, hey, no, 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 let's, let's have some distance here about the, the technique we're going to use. Let, let's at least show that we are tennis players. But um, I will focus more on them having fun, knowing what to do with the racket, knowing what to do with the shots, and you know, probably ask him to, to play in a smaller area. If you do that, they're going to control the ball because they're going to control it more because if you, they hit the ball too hard, they're going to be picking up balls all the time. If you work in a small area, close range, they're going to have to control the ball better. Obviously, the ball is coming slower. They won't lose their balance. So that's going to be easier for them to control 
ball and, and body. That's my advice. Martin, you, you worked in the US and you worked in in Europe. So um, when you when you look at the when you look at uh, kids programs, you know, is is there like is there any difference or like did, what did you learn over the years, you know, like what what is the what they're doing here maybe what they're doing over in, in Europe differently or like any any good things, any bad things, any anything that comes to your mind. I think that's always a interesting well I, I have to say it was 20 years ago that i was in the u.s um but uh good thing there was always a, a four to one ratio between players and coaches not more than that for example if you go to madrid they're um they're public courts mm -hmm. so the 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 fees for the kids are very cheap so you have in, in, in a club where you have probably six courts you have 600 kids in your program but obviously, um, you have 10 kids per court on each session. That's not really good for the quality of a, the, the, the players. Mm -hmm. But uh, having that ratio, you can work better with the kids. The problem is that it was too focused on technique, too focused on repetitions. And if you would have say, I, I want to do something more creative. No, 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 no. You have to follow these patterns because people don't like it. And um, I, I can understand that the American philosophy is a, a, we, we've always been following these patterns. We're not going to change it. And uh, that's, that was very difficult for me to see that, hey, but I'm going to show you something that's really useful for the kids and it's fun. And we can have eight kids on the court. We can't do that. No, no, no. Parents are going to complain. So it was better for the parents to see four kids standing still by doing, you know, this the forehand mechanic. But uh, they said, you know, that, that's the way they have to learn. We're not going to change that. We're not going to allow anyone to change it. So that's something that was kind of frustrating for me. Then I came to Spain in different, you know, same thing or, you know, coaches are more cre creative or, Others that use a lot of games to, to teach, um, not to focus on, on technique, but the problem in Spain is too many young kids teaching um, youngsters. Too many 19, 20 year olds teaching with not ex the exact knowledge or proper knowledge how to handle kids. Or So the, the, the sessions will be too, um, too much fun too many games, but not exactly related to tennis. Uh, I call them the backyard game, the, the school backyard games. Uh, the, the things you play um, on a, in a break when you're in school and you play hide and seek and cops and thieves and all of that, they will do the same. Uh, but this, you're not teaching anything. You, you're ent entertaining the kids, but not, you're not teaching uh, properly. So um, that's what I found when I came to Spain. Uh, things are changing, obviously. Social media helps a lot, confuses a lot sometimes. But uh, when you filter the information and you see some, some good coaches working, and you follow those steps, uh, you can see people that is working really good. You can get inspired by that. Martin, um let me see quickly. I answered this one, I think. Let me show the video so we can continue with that and then we can talk over. Yeah. These are progressions that I do with kids. Again, close range, only one ball. Ball is always coming back to me. So we work specifically on trying to keep the balance when they hit. Same thing on the back end. I use too many objects. I, if I have a volleyball or a softball or a frisbee, anything that is attractive for the kids. I like using that. She's doing a progression, holding the racket from the top of the grip. She is not controlling that much. After a minute, a few minutes, she was controlling much better the position. Always doing the split step. I'm a big fan of the split step. Oh, this is a progression in Greece. Uh, this girl, uh, two-handed backhand, she never hit a slice backhand. So in five minutes, we did this progression. 
and eventually she started knowing what to do with the racket, only hitting with one hand. But uh, again, if you don't rush, if you you stand too close to the player, you you don't they don't pay attention to the fact that they have to hit the ball really hard. That makes it more difficult because this case, for example, this girl wouldn't know what to do with one hand to hit the ball hard. But if you're standing close, they don't have to hit the ball hard. Uh, they control the racket better. They control the ball better and understand the, game, the shots much easier. This is something I really like. I said, I, we were saying before, tracks and, and stations. There, were, there was eight kids, only one ball in use. Eight kids running through the tracks and only one ball. They were hitting the ball back to me. See, again, balance. I love working this type of things with the kids. 11-year-old, this kid also from the same club, Tennis Barcelona. This kid is a very, I call him Djokovic. He's very consistent from the baseline, never misses a shot. But when he has to attack, he's not getting any shot, any winning shots. So we're working on moving forward. See, this same kid, different day, working the same thing, trying to move him forward. Trying to teach him how to, you know, uh, be more aggressive on that forehand. This is in Mexico. Kids learning how to, or improving their um, returning technique. Split, catching the ball, bracket in front of them, no big backswing, and then eventually will do the shot with a short backswing if the ball will come faster to them. I love doing these progressions because it's fun for the kids. It's not, you know, they, they don't have to uh, wait a lot or wait for many repetitions from the players. And and the other thing is you can use this kind of uh, methodology by working with someone like, like Maka, my friend from Chile. She is from um, Chile, but uh, she plays wheelchair tennis, number 13 in the world, I think. She's good. So that's about it in terms of the video, trying to show the way I work with them in different ages. I, lo I love it. I love the, we have a couple of minutes left. I love the playful approach. And by, people, by the way, yeah. um, Davor. Yes. Talk, talk you can about, see it, right? Yeah, Martin, talk about how, so I'm gonna, I have the emails from everybody and I will send yeah. them I will send them all your information, all the links you have, and tell us uh, a little bit uh, about the, the book, Martin, you, you um, wrote. Okay, the book will be uh, out uh, very soon. I'm going to announce it. Um, it's a very special book. It explains more of my philosophy, uh, but explains by detail how to work with little kids from foam ball, red, orange, green, also yellow, how to work with adults, how to work with disabled people, for example, wheelchair, syn Down syndrome, uh, blind tennis. Um, and the good thing is, I wanted to make it a special. Um, there are links or QR codes right next to a guide that has a picture, a text talking about the, what is going on in the picture. And if you scan it with the phone, uh, right next to the QR code, uh, you you have a um, a YouTube um, video from my channel popping up, and you see what's going on in that exercise. And there are 110 videos, if I'm not mistaken. Um, very graphic. I know it's very rich in all that format, but I I, I think it's going to be very helpful for all coaches. Um, Judy Murray, Severin Tamborero, um, David. Uh, Sands from Spain, um, Pepe Vendrell, uh, um, Roberto Bautista's coach, uh, all of them wrote in the Carla Suarez, Lara Robarena, uh, Joffre Porta, all these big guys, big names, um, they wrote for the book. Alex Correcha made the, the foreword. So um, I'm very grateful to them because they wanted to cooperate. The benefits from this book are going to, straight to Tennis Aid, my association that we promote tennis around the world. So I'm not gonna get any money from that. 
I'm, I'm going to keep being poor, but I'm hap I'll be happy, All right? Um, but I think it's going to be helpful for our coaches because it's going to be a good guide for, um, you know, to, to work with different kids, different ages, and in a very creative way. That's something I try to do most of the time. Um, so I hope if you buy it, I appreciate it, but I, I hope you like it. Nice. I like that. So question is like great stuff, Jens, uh, name of the YouTube channel. So mini players, is it, if you type in mini players, is that the YouTube channel, Martin? I'm going to send the link out anyway later tonight or tomorrow. I'll see time wise. And then Martin's going to send me all his links and everything. Yeah. Everybody's going to get it with the email you guys provided. And um, yeah, as I said, you can contact Martin always. He's going to be happy. He has an amazing newsletter with so much information. It's so valuable. Yeah. Like guys, if you, uh, I got so much information out of it. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, you can uh, send you everything. And Yeah, I see some members here. Uh, Hirsch or Joanna from Greece. Ayana, hmm. um, friends that I have that I created this community with mini players and uh, I send them information through the newsletter and they try to not share my information. It's follow, for, for example, um, uh, Tennis House is one of the links that is connected to the newsletter always. So uh, if, uh, if I see videos from coaches that I really like and admire, I, I post them, I have them on the newsletter so people can see it. I want, I want to share that. It's not only my information. It's, uh, I want to share you know, other people's work. And um, so far it's doing good. 350 coaches already joined. So um, it's nice. I hope they, they enjoy what they see. Nice. Yeah, that's, we share the same philosophy. That's what I like about your work as well. Like, you know, we're never too proud to learn from someone else, right? And, and always here to, to, to share. And um, Joanna, yeah. that she's my friend, <laughs> Martin. We worked together, and that was my only trip this year. I was supposed to do a lot of trips to different congresses and workshops, and the only one I did was uh, in Athens, and I spent great time with these people. Yeah. Beautiful. It's not, it's Beautiful. not a bad trip to Athens. I've been there a couple of times too. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> well, all right, uh, Martin. So, guys, you know, um. With the email you provided, I will send you everything you need to know about Martin, all the information. Um, yeah, I think that was the first Tennis House Masterclass. I'm, I'm honored that Martin, that you did the first one. Um, you know, we're going to have people that participate. I want to thank you guys because you take time from your day to get better in what you're doing. And um, yeah, that's, that's always a, a big thing for... for um, for us to see that we that that's appreciated and then the continuous learning and the education is is so important you know and uh, from my part thank you everybody for, for for being part of the first one the next one we're going to try to have every week one so the next one's going to be as well like kids tennis 10 and under tennis uh, i think that's very important that's why i wanted to just kick it off with that and then in the future we're going to have atp players atp coaches and for me, priority was first the kids' tennis. So stay, you will stay updated with the emails I send you. Uh, Martin, one last uh, word of, from you. Uh, I want to thank you again. Um, I know the, the best, uh, I know the people that's going, you're going to invite, they're, they're the best in business. So um, I want to thank all the coaches that, are, that pay attention to this chat, uh, listening to two crazy guys. <laughs> But uh, I really appreciate you guys taking time to, to see this. Um, following from different countries, I see a lot of places here. Uh, so um, I really appreciate that you paid attention to this. I hope it was helpful. And, and again, um, that was gonna send all the information. If you wanna contact me, I'm always open. I, I don't even sleep. I sleep four hours a day. So I have plenty of time to answer questions and I'll be happy if you need anything and I can help in some way. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. And one more, one more thing, guys. Uh, Rajiv asked if the USPTA gave him continuous ad, ad for that. Not yet. I'm going to talk to the USPTA because we're going to have 
uh, amazing coaches like Martina in there. And uh, I totally, totally think it's going to happen. I just have to talk to them. I wanted to kick it off. You know, I didn't want to wait any longer. And uh, I will keep you updated on that as well. So, Martin, sí, muchas gracias en español para toda la gente de España también. Muchas gracias para que has hecho eso conmigo. And tenemos que hacerlo en inglés porque la mayoría de la gente habla inglés. Pues es como es. Yeah, and, um, yeah so... Um, yeah, thank you everybody, and uh, I hope I hope you guys follow us uh, in the future, and um, we're building a strong community.